Jordan Giesegi from The Limiting Factor is the de facto battery genius on YouTube, though I'm sure that's high praise he might take issue with. Well, he joined us for an interview, and this is part two of that interview. It's the final part. I'm Brian. Welcome to my Tesla weekend. So one of the things I've seen is people who seem to have a vested interest in not transitioning to EVs like to pretend that we are going to run out of raw materials to make batteries before the transition can happen. Hmm? Is oh. that... Uh, well, it's, it's, they're uh, taking a... Uh, <laughs> they're running a bit too far with uh, a certain narrow truth like so often happens. So the raw materials, it will continue to grow. There's going to, we're not going to reach like a hard cap of raw materials. And there's going to be innovations that allow us to stretch the current raw materials further. But what is true is that uh, companies like Tesla and Chinese battery companies, they're growing faster than the raw material supply chain can grow. So uh, it's going to, the transition to sustainable energy will be slowed if we don't do something about raw materials. And what we need to do about raw materials is make permitting more easy because it's uh, just building the mines and building the factories. It's, uh, I wouldn't say it's straightforward, but uh, we have uh, the manpower and the know-how to do it. And the materials are out there. It's just a matter of red tape, et cetera, that gets in the way of opening these mines up and getting them productive. So, um, I think for the next year or two, we're good on raw materials, depending on which company that you're, you're talking about, because every battery is a combination of raw materials. And if any raw material is missing, then you can't make that battery. But overall, as an industry, the next year or two, at least from what I could tell, there's enough raw materials there. But getting into 2024, 2025, um, depending on the company, uh, we're going to start seeing uh, tapering or... Uh, now, that's as an industry as a whole. Now, this is where the, the strategies of individual companies come into play. Because Tesla, uh, for instance, a raw material supplier might say, hey, we only want to give you 50% of the material that comes out of our mine because we don't want to be owned by you. We want to diversify because that's in the best interest of our shareholders. Um, so Tesla could go, well... We have an enormous amount of money. We have deep pockets and a massive checkbook. So uh, we're just going to either buy your company or we're going to get a controlling interest in your mind. We're going to bankroll it or some, some way find a way to secure more than 50% of the raw materials. So uh, even though the raw material supply chain might, may not be growing, Tesla is in a position where they may be able to take um, more uh, more of a share of that growth than other people will. Because I think right now Tesla has maybe uh, 25% of the batteries in the world that are being produced. Uh, I don't have a solid number on that. That's just off the top of my head. But, you know, if they can increase their proportion of the market from 25% to 50%, that leaves them a lot of room for growth. And in terms of, there's a lot of people saying as well that um, the raw materials aren't an issue. Oh, they're definitely an issue. Um, and this is why Elon's starting to tweet about it. When he said a couple of years ago, I think it was a shareholder meeting, et cetera, or maybe last year. Yeah, it was last year. Um, I think it was a quarterly earnings call. He said, there's plenty of lithium in the ground. I said, "Wow, that's a narrow truth. To me, <laughs> there's raw materials in the ground, um, and then there's actually turning it into something. And I was like... Is he just saying this because he's in negotiations with somebody and he doesn't want to up the price of whatever company he's trying to, to acquire, et cetera. But now he's changed his tone and he's saying, hey, we, I think we might need to get into the lithium mining, which is what I wanted to hear last year. So there's something going on there. I think he's being, uh, from my perspective, uh, he's choosing his words carefully to um, uh, put Tesla in a good position to maybe buy up mining assets, et cetera. Um, but a good example of where we're at with raw materials is Tesla just, uh, there's a rumor that they signed an agreement with Vale, which is a, a Brazilian nickel producer. Uh, and people are like, oh, great. That's new nickel that Tesla's getting. No, that's not new nickel. Basically at this point, we're starting to rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, that nickel was used for other things going into other products. And now, uh, the Tesla 
must be providing them with enough of a motivation for them to ship that nickel supply over to batteries, something like 30 to 35% of their supply, if the rumors are true. So um, you can't just keep taking nickel from other industries to supply batteries. We need new nickel supply. Now, there is some coming online, but a lot of it's dirty, like it's from Indonesia. So I think, uh, I think this is why Tesla is trying to – this is why they always say sustainably produced raw materials because for Tesla – Getting the raw materials and getting them sustainably sourced, those are very important to the company. Uh, otherwise, I think they would be signing more details or signing more agreements with uh, Indonesian producers like VW is. Uh, those agreements that VW is signing in Indonesia, it may come back to bite them because it may be a PR nightmare when people find out what's going on in minds. <laughs> You're knocking stuff over. <laughs> I'm knocking stuff over. <clears throat> So, um, you hinted at some things, you mentioned some things in your most recent video. What did you learn from touring Giga Texas? Well, there's the specific and broadly, broadly, nobody's going to catch up to Tesla and manufacturing. Just, I mean, nobody's even close. Uh, nobody's even close to what Tesla was doing several years ago with Giga Nevada, producing their own battery cells with a company quasi in-house um all we see is promises from other companies going uh me too well we can do that too um, we're going to do giga casting as well we're going to produce cells in-house we're going to secure raw materials and the key um wording there is we're going to and we have plans to but it's all abstract future dates and tesla is doing it now so and not only are they doing uh, those things now, they're doing all of those things right now. Whereas other companies are going, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Oh, this is a buzzword. Let's throw that into the marketing material. So uh, I don't know which auto companies are going to survive, uh, but it's 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 not looking good. And this, once again, comes back to the raw materials thing. If Tesla does have the deep, po deepest pockets, they can secure the most raw materials, then where does that leave everybody else if they scoop, if Tesla in China scoops up the raw materials? They won't even get the raw, be able to get the raw materials they need to make batteries. Um, but going back to your question about Giga, oh, sorry, Giga Austin. There's so many Gigas now. <clears throat> um, in, in terms of the specific details, there's actually there's things that Tesla has delivered on from Battery Day, like the 4680, the structural battery pack, in-house manufacturing, um, Giga castings, etc. And then there's things that Tesla didn't mention at Battery Day that are important uh, that they didn't even bring up at Battery Day. Like, uh, as I was saying, increasing the safety of those nickel-based battery packs and also being able to attach the seats directly to the structural battery pack so they can lift it into the car. That's an amazing innovation. Nobody else is doing anything like that. Um, and then there's the things that Tesla promised at Battery Day that we don't have confirmation of yet. Now, it's not that... Um, those things haven't happened yet or they aren't doing them. It's just uh, we ha we don't have more details yet. Like, what's the actual chemistry inside that battery cell? Is it actually cobalt-free? How's Tesla going with their um, producing a nickel, sorry, a lithium hydroxide plant? Um, do they still plan on taking those lithium clays and uh, uh, doing mining that way? So... Overall, the most important things, the more important near-term things for manufacturing, Tesla is doing. So they're delivering on what they promised, and all the naysayers were just, well, they're full of it. So, yeah, that's uh, – if you, if you have any questions, feel free to dig in. That's kind of a smattering view. No, I, I enjoyed the most recent video where you were showing the – new cooling systems for the giga casting. And that was like, and, and the engineer was like being real squirrely about it. He's like, just look, just <laughs> look. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's in my photo, there was two tanks, uh, but the, right? and in reality, there was three tanks and there's also looked like there was a heat exchanger. So what I think they're doing, at least for, from what I can gather from other people, they're probably using like a glycol water solution, something like that. Cause, um, Water and has a really high capacity to, to soak up heat. And uh, I think what they're doing is probably running multiple loops to different parts of the casting machine and using a different tank to each and uh, heat exchangers to kind of um, 
you know, deal with the thermal regulation. But I don't know enough about that topic. I'm mostly talking out my ass here. I'm just excited about it. And it's just more proof to me that Tesla, you know, they start doing gigacasting, but, you know, the gigacasting rate isn't high enough for them. So what they're doing is implementing an entirely new cooling system to push those machines as hard as they can. Um, trying to think if there's any other uh, there's a YouTube channel called Five Years Ahead that did some analysis on the pack. I was suggesting that there might be dummy cells in the pack. Like, for instance, if you want a different pack size, you just pop in dummy cells. But he's saying is, actually, if you just, it looks like they put spacers in the battery pack. And rather than putting dummy cells in, you just make the battery pack narrower and make the strings the same number of lengths. So to me, that makes a lot more sense. You don't have to mess around with these dummy cells. You just pop fewer strings in and put a spacer in. And Bob's your uncle. So, um, yeah, just little innovations like that all through the process are what makes a difference. So a lot of people say, I need more range. I need a 500 miles. I need a 1,000 miles. Now, while I would disagree with that, when it comes to towing, you definitely need a lot more range. Rivian recently tried to, uh, who is it, out-of-spec motoring, I think, did a towing test, and they had to stop every 100 miles. That's not practical. How soon do you think we could get something like that? Something with with the kind of range that would enable towing? All this thing is, is I don't know enough about trucks and towing to be able to give. Um, well, then a thousand mile battery. <laughs> a thousand mile battery. Well, the thing is, I think with the t uh, technology that Tesla has upcoming with the structural battery pack and uh, the cell densities that they can achieve, I think you could get. Um, as Elon said, they could do a 600 mile range vehicle now if they wanted to. Um, it's just a matter of, I don't think it's a matter of ability now uh, where in, in the past, like when they did the first model S model X, etc., cetera, uh, they were really pushing to get those batteries stuffed in the bottom, the bottom of that pack and made it, make it, uh, to give you a decent amount of range. But now it's come down to, well, where, if we want to transition the world to sustainable energy, where's the best place to put those battery cells? And I think. My view is that's going to be lower down on their priority list uh, because it's uh, now with the semi, that's an exception because it's towing massive loads every single day. And it's um, there's a huge opportunity to reduce CO2 emissions. But if you're talking for the average consumer, oh, uh, putting a massive battery pack in a cyber truck, it doesn't make sense because those those people aren't going to be using that battery pack to its full extent every single day like you would a semi. So if I was Tesla, I would go, all right. Let's put um, just enough range in these vehicles to where it's uh, a useful vehicle for people. But I think the people who are like looking for long range towing for trucks and things like that, I think it's going to be quite a long time before we have um, a battery pack for the average consumer that will satisfy uh, what they need. Uh, something that'll match the current um, trucks, like, you know, uh, large trucks that we have today where you're getting several hundred miles while towing something. Sure. I'd like with to be two, wrong. With two giant gas tanks. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I think that's going to be a while. And I think um, they're – I'm not a big fan of hydrogen, but I do see use cases, niche use cases, where hydrogen can, can be useful until batteries fill the gap. But uh, what it comes down to me is it's like, well, is it worth – investing the time, energy, and effort into hydrogen when eventually battery cells will get there later this decade. If I was a company, I, w I wouldn't do that. Um, it's just the efficiency of hydrogen is less than batteries. So in the longer term, batteries make sense. I think that's why Tesla isn't pursuing it. It's like, well, we'll get there. Until then, uh, people will con continue to use gasoline for their vehicles until we can um, – get enough raw materials and get the, you know, basically get the raw materials and battery supply um, to a high enough production rate where we can do vehicles like that for people. I had considered including some hydrogen questions, but the fundamental limits of the physics made me just think, what a waste of time. This guy's got so much insight. Why would we even duck about it? Well, so I will say this about hydrogen. Now, for vehicles, things like that, um, like shipping, trucking, it, there's there's a potential for it to make sense. Fuel cells, no. It's when you have. Um, I think Sandy Ron Rose said this, but uh, 
if you're using a fuel cell, that doesn't make sense at all to me because basically you're just dealing with a hybrid when you're talking something like that. It's an overly complicated system for a fuel cell. Now, running a vehicle off hydrogen, that's a different story. But still, batteries will get there eventually. Now, where hydrogen makes sense is long-duration energy storage. Because what you can do, well, like with batteries, the power and the energy are coupled. The rate that you can get that uh, power out of the battery and the amount of energy that you can put in that battery pack are pretty tightly joined. You can tweak it. But with hydrogen, what you can do is you can make absolutely massive tank farms for hydrogen. And then in terms of getting the, turning that hydrogen into useful power and energy, well, that's up to you how you design the system. You can put uh, 50 generators in place or you can put one generator in place. Um, so if you have a massive tank farm with one little generator, then uh, that makes sense for energy storage beyond like six, seven, eight hours. So it does have a place in the grid. In terms of transport, it's more questionable to me. So along with range, one thing that can alleviate range anxiety is faster charging times. Mm -hmm. Do we expect faster charging times? And what is the limiting factor? Uh, well, there's multiple limiting factors in there. That's a good question. <laughs> um, so... As we've seen over time with Tesla, they're continually increasing the charge rate. And I think we'll continue to see that. They're increased the capacity of superchargers, which is absolutely essential. They're increasing um, the, they're, they're continually improving the cooling system. Um, and they're starting to use materials, which would indicate that they can increase the charge rate. And they're uh, implementing features like the tapless electrode. So, I, and I see them constantly creeping forward on all these fronts, making improvements. So I think, you know, year by year basis, we'll uh, continually see the charge rate increasing. And it may, uh, it'll happen in fits and starts because the, the charging system is only good as it's the slowest, uh, what's the best way to put it? The, the slowest charging uh, uh, part of the, the process because, you know, is that the charger? Is it the batteries? I think with the new 4680 battery cell and the, the U-shaped cooling loops that they're using in those, the architecture of the pack itself and the fact that it's safer, I, I don't think the 4680 and battery pack are the limiting factor anymore for charge rate. I think it's very much a matter, matter of upgrading the charging stations themselves. I could be wrong, but that's just my point of view. And I think that's why Elon has said that they're in, uh, intending to increase the charge rate of these chargers. I think he handed to that recently. I'd have to double check that, but yeah, it's on the way regardless, but it's not going to happen overnight. It's just going to be year by year. You're going to see improvements. So in terms of battery companies, who should we look to, to see big things? Tesla. <laughs> Never heard of them. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, they're, Tesla's at the cutting edge now. They went from having no, um, no battery uh, production in-house to being at the very cutting edge of battery technology. And I think most of the improvements that you're going to see are from, from the established industry players uh, because you have you know Panasonic, LG, um, CATL, etc. And those companies have so much resource at their disposal. So many economies of scale that we're going to see continue to see incremental improvements from them. And I do think in the next few years we're going to see increases in energy density due to slightly higher levels of silicon in the batteries, etc. In terms of startups, I mean, there's there's it's such a thick field with startups, and most of them aren't going to make it. It's, there's like a Cambrian explosion of batteries at the moment. There's so many different ways to uh, improve batteries. What it's going to come down to is how well and how quickly they're able to industrialize those improvements. So it's, it's like uh, uh, Gene Berdachevsky, who formerly worked at Tesla, he said, it's what matters most is the first to scale because he has a company called Sila Nanotechnologies and he's working on silicon anodes. And it's I think he hit the, hit the nail on the head where it's like, well, everybody has promises. What matters is getting those into production, generating revenue, generating profit, and it's whoever can survive. And then whoever survives, the competition between those is going to weed it out even further into the companies that uh, truly reach massive scale. But at that point, I think 
a lot of those companies, they might just get bought up by like Panasonic, LG Chem, or Tesla if they really do have something. So Tesla is doing a lot of things right, and it's easy to Monday morning quarterback. Is there anything you can see they're doing wrong or that you would tell if they came to Jordan and said, what do we need to do better? What do you, is there anything you would suggest? I think what it comes down to is what I don't know. And uh, what I don't know is enough about their raw material situation. Uh, but I think that just all the things that Elon has been saying to me that were saying lately to me indicate that that's where his mind is at because they literally need mountains of raw materials to uh, continue to scale at 50% growth rate per year. I'm seeing indications of uh, the kind of their strategy and plans playing out. And there's not just one strategy. There's, I think they're going to implement multiple strategies at once to secure these materials. And I'm hoping that they have people in Washington trying to influence uh, what's going on with the legislation. Because in order to get all the raw materials we want, if we want those raw materials to be clean, it, it's going to take and it's going to take a whole of society approach. It's almost like we have to kind of uh, rewrite the social contract around mining and um, uh, rethink how we do mining and permitting. And it's it needs to happen at every level to make that happen. I think it takes maybe uh, a few years to permit a mine in Canada, whereas in the U.S. it takes like a decade, which is just ridiculous. So Pro prohibitive. Yeah, it's absolutely prohibitive. So. Like if it's geopolitical, geopolitically extremely important for U.S. to have access to these raw materials, because it's not like we don't have these materials in the U.S. We have most of the battery raw materials that we need here. So uh, I'm going on a political rant now, but it's uh, it's critically important for us not to be in the same situation that we were with um, oil. Batteries are very different because it's not batteries themselves aren't energy. What they are is just, it takes a, a lot of raw materials to build them. And then you can cycle the energy through over and over again. Uh, but we, we don't want to be beholden to a foreign power when it comes to our energy security is what it comes down to. So you recently did a panel at TeslaCon with Sandy Monroe. What was that yeah. like? Uh, it was great. Yeah. It was, um, like at, uh, you were there. Everybody is exactly as you'd expect them to be on, on their YouTube channel. You meet people and it's like, okay, well, this is, you know, it's kind of freaky. It's, it's like you've, if you watch somebody's YouTube channel a few times, you, um, you meet them in real life and it's just like, you know, uh, they're exactly how they are on the screen. So yeah, it was me, Sandy Monroe and, uh, Farzad Mesbahi. And that was really enjoyable. Uh, I was quite nervous because I'd never spoken in front of a crowd that large before. <laughs> and, uh, just a funny story. Like before we got on stage, uh, I was nervous and both Farzad and Sandy were just cool as cucumbers. Like Farzad, there's like a buffet back in the green room. And he was like, we're just about to go up on stage. And he's stuffing his mouth with the buffet. And he's like, I got you, bro. We're good. We're good. And Sandy <laughs> was like, oh, don't worry. It's, it's the same talking to like five people. It is to like 50 people. We get on stage and I start to relax because all the focus is on Sandy. But I could see Sandy and Farzad start to like get a little bit nervous because there's like so many people out there and they're chanting Sandy, Sandy. So it was, uh, uh, I think we were all kind of when we got up there, we're just a little bit uh, anxious. Um, but, you know, um, about 30 percent, 50 percent of the way into the discussion, I think we really hit our pace. And what I really enjoyed about that conversation is all three of us have the same priorities. And that is, A, having a culture, um, or it all revolves around culture, really. Just having a culture where uh, you can make mistakes and there's not bureaucracy and um, trying to unlock human potential as much as we can. So I think, you know, Sandy or I, we're mainly focused on about technology, but what you know, you can't have technology without a proper culture to develop that technology. And that's what we're all passionate about. Let's not do things the stupid way. Why are we throwing people's lives away, working in these factories, trying to grind them to dust when we should be looking at the process holistically? We can improve the production output, you know, two or three times by improving the engineering processes. Whereas like if you're just trying to squeeze 
uh, one or two more widgets a day out of people that just, you know, it kills their joints. It, it destroys their body. It makes their lives more difficult. Um, why not take the easy path and focus on uh, investing more in engineering and the process as whole rather than trying to just take it out of people's backs? Um, so, yeah, and just when you go to work every day, you don't want to do something stupid. It's it's torture to um, do something that you know is idiotic. And uh, I think, you know, it, it gives me a lot of hope for the future that you see Tesla trying as much as possible to uh, focus on the engineering and technology and um, getting the most out of their people. Because I think it, you know, improves the quality of people's lives. And there's just... Um, the era that we're living in, there's we have so many dysfunctional power structures at the moment, and uh, it's disappointing. And it's like Tesla's kind of a ray of hope, and it's I think that's probably the best way to put it. Is uh, yeah, Tesla gives us me hope. It gives Farzad hope. It gives Sandy Monroe hope uh, about um, the future because you know we're taking advantage of uh, people's skills and giving them something to look forward to. Anyhow, that's kind of rambling, but uh, that's about the best I can summarize it. So, Jordan, I want to thank you first for making a channel that provides something that no one else has between you and Sandy Monroe. Those are, those are the kinds of information you can't get by just reading the news. A lot of channels provide – a lot of channels are just news readers. I don't know. I find them valuable, but not everyone does. So I want to thank you for that, for giving so generously to the community. I want to thank you for your time today. And for those of you at home, uh, what did I miss or misunderstand? Leave me all your thoughts in them comments below. What should I have asked Jordan? What do I have to catch up with him on next time? So stay tuned. Stay juicy. And uh, I guess I could say Jordan and I can't wait to hear from you clever robots next time. And also a quick thank you to my Patreons who get early access, bonus content, an ad-free experience, and help keep the channel running. For as little as a buck a month. Yeah, they get ad-free stuff and bonus stuff and early stuff. And at the $10 level and above, a look at my 11-year production prediction tracker. It's all a lot of fun. And they're actually the reason this channel is able to keep going, since YouTube famously pays F all in terms of ad revenue. Thank you guys so much for your ongoing decision to support the channel. It really does mean a lot to me.